Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, small lecture I'm going to present uh, uh, soon on the topic of uh, uh, ulcer ethics uh, and uh, psychiatry. Uh, this is uh, the result of an article I published with uh, Professor Englander um, in the edited book that Professor Englander uh, wrote, and I'm going to talk more about that. And uh, this lecture is uh, precisely for uh, uh, the students uh, of uh, uh, professor in Landers for the University of Malmo. Unfortunately, we scheduled uh, this uh, webinar uh, for a time that was a little too late for me. It was three in the morning. So um, we found this way to make things work. Um, if uh, you have any question, uh, uh, doubts uh, after uh, watching this video, uh, please let me know, reach me on uh, emails or uh, um, write a comment under the video. And and uh, I will be happy to reply to your questions. So now I am going to share my screen. And uh, uh, oh, we start from the thank you here. Um, mm, mm, mm. Here you go. Uh, so, uh, in this lecture, I'm going to discuss uh, um, the interconnection between uh, phenomenological ethics, uh, psychiatry, psychology, uh, and uh, um, I would like to show how phenomenology can help to move forward in a certain uh, psychological or psychi psychiatric uh, issues. So, let's start from... <clears throat> The etymology. I always think that the etymology can provide a useful way to enter into the core of a certain issue without forcing uh, the meaning of something, but rather tapping into the uh, collective wisdom of that meaning. So I always find helpful to access the term through its uh, etymology. So um, uh, the word phenomenology comes from uh, uh, two terms, two verbs, if you want, or a noun and a verb. Uh, so uh, the first part, uh, uh, fe phenomenon, uh, indicates uh, uh, the ability to phenomai, to appear, to manifest. And logizusi uh, indicates uh, our ability to make sense, uh, to reason on what manifests itself to us. So phenomenology is uh, a term uh, certainly wide and complex uh, because uh, yeah, the phenomenology I'm going to refer to now is uh, Husserl's phenomenology. So it's something that started with Husserl. Nevertheless, uh, we start talking about phenomenology with uh, uh, Lambert, with, uh, of course, Hegel. Uh, we found references to phenomenology in Hegel. I mean, phenomenology is a term uh, much uh, uh, wider than uh, how I'm using it today. And after Husserl, uh, we had other examples of phenomenology. Now we're talking about neurophenomenology, microphenomenology. Uh, so it's uh, a term that goes way beyond uh, its limits because the, 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 the word is powerful. Uh, why? Uh, because with phenomenology, we uh, realize the limits of our knowledge and we say, okay, I can understand and make sense only of what appears to me. Every, uh, the, uh, I accept that knowledge is uh, wider than uh, what I can grasp, what I can understand. It goes beyond me uh, and uh, it's uh, valid even if uh, I'm not there to witness uh, its validity. So I know that the um, Northern Star is going to be there even if I'm not be able uh, uh, to, to, to see it at night. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I can make sense of what I can experience. I make sense of what appears to me. I can know, I can understand, I can um, reason on my phenomena, meaning of what appears to me. And how do I make sense of this phenomena? Here I start using Husserl. Uh, through an organization of the concreteness of life 
on the facticity of life through ontological regions. Now, what does uh, uh, this term mean? The term ontology means uh, uh, the study of being. So life appears to us as a concreteness, as a um, portion of being of which we want to make sense. And this concreteness can be organized according to the quality of uh, uh, the concreteness. So I don't know, my intentions, my actions, uh, my reasonings, uh, uh, my feelings. These are all the different ontologies, an ethical ontology, the actions, uh, a psychological ontology, my feelings, a um, axiological ontology, my evaluations, or just the concreteness, my biological concreteness. Uh, so these are all the different uh, ontologies. Uh, the formal ontology is uh, the way in which we present uh, this concreteness to us. Because uh, even if uh, we are limited, uh, even if uh, there are different ways of knowing things, uh, there's a fact, we are all human beings and uh, uh, the structure of uh, our brain, the, the way in which we shape our thoughts, the way in which we shape our language is always the same. So formal ontology is basically a, a logic uh, through which uh, formal ontology could be logic or mathematics uh, is the uh, basic way of reasoning through which we phrase the content of this concreteness. So it's the basic way uh, through which we give shape to the messiness, to the um, variety of uh, uh, experience we come in contact with. Now, uh, again, in Husserl's phenomenology, uh, we use uh, two approaches uh, to investigate uh, the ontological regions uh, and uh, uh, the formal ontologies that give uh, a shape uh, to the concreteness of these ontological reason, regions. We have, on the one hand, static phenomenology, uh, a static approach to these meanings, and on the other hand, a genetic phenomenology. So the static phenomenology, which is the form of phenomenology we come in contact with uh, when reading uh, the logical investigations, for example, presents the phenomenon uh, and the meanings that this phenomenon is going to show to me as a static picture. So it's a screenshot of that moment in time. Uh, and in... Uh, um, uh, Going back to the things themselves, right, the motto of phenomenology, in reflecting backwards on the way in which we gather that image, we can reconstruct a certain meaning. Uh, so, for example, uh, I want to investigate uh, the phenomenon of this uh, cup as it appears to me now, I will... Uh, look at the cup as it is now, and I will reflect on the ways in which the cup appears to me. I will describe its structure, its structure, and I would make sense of the meaning of this cup. Now, things get way more complicated when we want to analyze uh, uh, ontological regions of the psychology or ethics, when we want to cut through the very messiness of life, right? The way in which we make decisions, the way in which uh, human beings behave. In that case, a static phenomenology mm, would not, would help because uh, through static phenomenology, we can uh, circumscribe, circum we can uh, define the limits of the lived experience that we want to analyze. Uh, but certainly it doesn't help us in um, gathering uh, the motivations that uh, brings to that phenomenon, the uh, complex network of dynamics that are behind uh, the expression of that phenomenon. So for that, uh, Husserl, 
And we are talking about the later Husserl here. We are talking about the Husserl of experience and judgment, the Husserl of the lecture of active and passive synthesis, for example. Uh, Husserl introduces uh, a genetic approach to phenomenology, which uh, uh, calls uh, into uh, the phenomenological reflection not only uh, the uh, uh, reflection on meanings, but also uh, complex notions like time, body, affections. So while uh, in the logical investigations, uh, Husserl uh, examines uh, um, uh, a form of intentionality that uh, uh, we would consider uh, uh, mostly active, so mostly focused on the meaning making process of a certain phenomenon in genetic uh, in, uh, with the genetic approach to phenomenology we have to cut through uh, many more forms of intentionality and if you read for example the lessons of active and passive synthesis uh, you have a sense for the complexity I'm talking about uh, here uh, in this book I wrote uh, now in uh, 2015 I think Think on Husserl's ethic and ethics and practical intentionality, I theorize with the Husserl's permission, I mean, using Husserl's manuscripts and works, that to analyze the ontological region of ethics, we need to focus especially on practical intentionality. Now, I'm going to explain myself. Let's start from the very beginning. What is intentionality? Um, intentionality is basically that uh, structure that allows me to connect to certain phenomena. The word intentionality uh, means uh, in tendere or uh, from Greek uh, en tenein. Basically, the word intentionality describes uh, that tension that connects me to the Lebensbelt, to the life world. So, Living is intentionality, because in my life, uh, there is uh, an ongoing tension that connects me to something that um, is not exactly me, nevertheless uh, is uh, connected to me. So intentionality is uh, that tension through which uh, this cap uh, which is not the same as I am, becomes part of my experience, becomes part of my life world, so much so that if I don't have a cup, this cup in front of me now, I can have uh, somehow the image of this cup and I can reflect on it, I can make sense of it, I can make a meaning out of this phenomenon. So intentionality is the value we can say uh, the best way to describe my consciousness and consciousness in general in the life world because intentionality is the way in which uh, I access to life or I connect to life is this tension to life. Now, intentionality is quite a complex uh, concept, as you can uh, as you can imagine. Uh, it's the center of phenomenology, according to uh, certain students of uh, Husserl. And uh, as you can see, uh, the more Husserl uh, uh, clarifies phenomenology, uh, the more uh, he, um, the more forms of intentionality he mentions in his manuscripts. Now, in my work, since I was trying to make sense of Husserl's ethics and to constitute a, a coherent system of uh, Husserl's ethics, which we find scattered in uh, different manuscripts and articles and books, I organized all the different forms of intentionality he mentions in uh, uh, his manuscripts uh, in three groups, uh, in three main groups, uh, passive, uh, active and practical intentionality. Um, <clears throat> passive intentionality, uh, as Husserl 
explains is uh, this form of intentionality that describes uh, my um, life uh, as a corporate and as life, meaning my life uh, as an organic body among other bodies and uh, my life as a subject of this body, as an animated body, as uh, energy that is embodying this uh, corpor, uh, as uh, it often emerges in philosophy. You know, one of the peculiarities in which uh, a human existence is, uh, is uh, the fact that uh, it's been caught into this uh, uh, polarity also talks about that in Natur und Geist, for example, we are nature, we are body among other bodies, but we are also guys, we are also spirit, we are also subjects that reflect on nature. And uh, is this reflection uh, the uh, motor that uh, creates meanings, uh, uh, moves us forward, uh, uh, pushes us uh, toward new uh, goals, uh, uh, new um, objects in life, objectives to achieve in life. So passive intentionality is basically uh, the life of nature. Uh, while I'm talking, so while uh, my uh, mind is all busy in uh, creating meanings uh, that uh, are capable to reach you and to talk to you, mm, my body is going, you know, I start feeling hungry, uh, uh, maybe some kind of tidiness from the day before is catching up on me, and so on and so on. Nevertheless, uh, this intentionality is passive, uh, meaning uh, patire, uh, you know, it's a uh, um, pasch in, in Greek. I'm feeling, uh, I'm suffering from, I'm feeling from this uh, energy, but I'm not uh, actively engaging with it. Passive intentionality is a uh, way larger, way more powerful, bigger than my ability to make sense of it, to engage with it. It might happen though, through the help of practical intentionality, that at some point, uh, uh, my body wakes me, it wakes me and uh, says, hey, you're hungry. <laughs> you need to uh, take care of it because uh, the level of energy of your body is uh, getting lower and lower and you need to engage with this hunger because you need to provide the energy. So it might happen in our days that these powerful powerful flow of intentions that uh, stream through our body uh, awakes us uh, and we have the aha moment. We have the moment in which we are called to a yes or no decision for which we have to make sense of this passivity and we have to decide whether to engage with it or not. For example, now, if I feel hungry, I wouldn't engage with it because uh, I, because my intentionality is more focused in making sense of all the knowledge I gathered around the subject and to transmit this knowledge to you. So my practical intentionality awakes me on something that I don't accept and I left it invalid flowing in the passive intentionality of my life and engages in something which I accept. When I accept this invitation from practical intentionality, so from my volitions, my instincts, my impulses, then my active intentionality has to make sense of it, has to make a meaning out of it. So uh, it's uh, this uh, alignment uh, between passive, practical, and active intentionality that is incredibly important both for ethics and for the ontological region of uh, psychiatry, psychology. Now, uh, to have, uh, to make sense of it, we have these passive synthesis that are mostly um, organized through a time 
which is the primary synthesis. So, so time is uh, what combines together uh, according to an a priori, according to uh, the sequence of uh, uh, before and afters, what it would make sense for us uh, on a phenomenic and a phenological level. So that is what we can see. There is a lower level of synthesis that is completely moved by my will, and the, it, it uh, combines things uh, together according to the way in which uh, they are uh, analogous with each other, according to the way in which they are different with each other, and we keep uh, uh, seeing, uh, uh, or better, combining, uh, this is very uh, connected to Hume's uh, uh, empiricism, we keep connecting uh, these uh, concreteness together and uh, uh, form uh, habits for which we keep saying, uh, yes, I can, or no, I cannot. Um, for example, uh, I might develop a personality structure for which uh, I do not accept to recognize, to acknowledge my hunger. I might develop some uh, eating disorders. Uh, in that case, uh, my body will let me know once, thrice, ten times that uh, what I'm experiencing now is hunger. But if uh, I keep saying uh, no to that hunger because I want to starve myself, because I want to exert control over this body, probably at some point uh, I will stop. I, I will not feeling uh, this message uh, uh, from my body, and I will start uh, neglecting this part of my life and meaning meanings out of it. That is extremely, uh, this is an extremely interesting uh, interconnection between ethics and psychology. I make a decision which which is very small, which is very uh, instinctive, very um, spontaneous uh, somehow, but also reasoned on a certain level because I'm deciding to repress my sense of hunger. And this decision, when it's repeated over and over again over my body, creates a certain psychological structure that is going to help me thrive or not. In this case, clearly, it creates a problem in my body. And this problem remains completely submerged in the intentionality of my body, in the passive intentionality that my body is feeling. So in order to unblock this problem, I have to come back to the passive synthesis, to the passive intentionality to which this meaning is provided to me, and see how I can make it flow again. This is a structure also of traumatic experiences. Uh, a traumatic experience keep knocking on the door of our uh, volitional body, of our practical intentionality. Um, the volitional body is <clears throat> an extremely uh, important term uh, that Husserl uses, for example, in uh, his lecture on active and passive synthesis. So the volitional body is in fact this uh, body uh, uh, that uh, we happen to uh, and live to animate. And uh, it's uh, the volitional body that uh, awakes when uh, uh, the affective of primary synthesis knock on our body. And it's this body that decides with its will whether to say yes or no to certain uh, primary synthesis. So it might happen, for example, with uh, traumatic experiences uh, that uh, we want to keep a sense of normality. We want to keep our life going. And so we say no to certain uh, primary synthesis. We might, uh, this primary synthesis might try to awake us, but we refuse that. We say no to that because we want to create a certain sense of normality. What's the problem here? The problem is that um, then the active intentionality, which should make sense of the passive synthesis, because that's the job of active intentionality, 
make sense of something that is completely externalized. Instead of looking at the uh, uh, primary synthesis that push on our volitional body and ask for meanings, for sense, for a definition that can fit for us, makes uh, meanings out of expectations, expectations that are completely externalized. I should be happy of my life now. Uh, I, show, I feel good because I'm so thin and uh, people love me. Um, I have a child with this man uh, and uh, I should be grateful for that. I forget that this man was violent with me uh, before having this child and so on and so on. So they, um, they intentionality that should make sense of what is organic and embodied uh, uh, ground into my lived experience uh, makes sense of something that is completely external. That's when in the ontological region of ethics, psychology and psychiatry, we start experiencing problems because there is not this align alignment between my life and my sense, and uh, the sense and the meanings are completely externalized. Here I created uh, a, a slide on, it's very difficult to put in slides after all uh, the complexity of uh, these reasonings, uh, but uh, in general, what uh, uh, active intentionality does is to transform the concreteness, the matter, the organic matter, matter of life, the fullness of life uh, that uh, happens to talk to us, uh, to enter into our uh, intentional sphere, into our phenomenon, into uh, something that is understandable, into a quality that uh, we can see. So, uh, I don't know, hunger is uh, something very organic, uh, very bodily. We can transform the bodily um, sense of hunger into a meaning, into something that makes sense for us, into a what, an idea. And clearly, when we talk about hunger, when we talk about this cup, um, we're talking about a very simple phenomena. Uh, much more complex is when we mention traumas, when we mention uh, um, suffering, feelings. In that sense, uh, we have to engage with more complex notions like uh, time, affections, um, bodily feelings, uh, which are the main ingredients, uh, as I showed you before, of the passive synthesis. Uh, of uh, uh, lower and uh, uh, sorry of lower and higher synthesis, which is basically the main ingredients with which our uh, uh, meanings comes to to us. So uh, our passive eye, uh, our uh, the passivity of our life is this stream of life that tends to aggregate together through a very specific sense of time, which is a phenomenological and a phenomenic time. By the phenomenological time, I mean the uh, very essential structure of time, which is made of protension and retention. So basically, uh, the matter of our being uh, tends to aggregate together and in each part, there's a part that looks forward and connects with what next and another part which retain what has just happened, what has just been into a precise structure. And the phenomenic time, which is the time of our logic, of our um, daily life, is the time of the before and after, is the time that allows us to organize ourselves in uh, a society. Uh, the, pass the messiness, the passivity of this uh, flow of life uh, organizes itself uh, according to different forms of time. The sense of time that uh, we live in the society and we measure on our clock is way different from the phenomenological time. When we go through a trauma, 
Um, this time, uh, Ricoeur, for example, wrote a beautiful pages on the psychological interpretation of time. Uh, when we go through a, a, a deep trauma, uh, the feeling, uh, the emotion that is uh, stuck in that trauma remains there forever, unless uh, through practical uh, intentionality, we accept to um, come in contact uh, with that trauma, unless our volitional body accept the connection with uh, that traumatic experience uh, and starts uh, actively to make sense of that. So if uh, we cut this interconnection here with the passivity and we accept uh, our normality or better, we accept uh, a, a externalized form of normality to make sense, to make the meaning for our practical life, then more than half of our life is cut away. Instead, if we accept, if our volitional body accepts to uh, internalize that trauma and the um, ever-living sense of uh, uh, that, that trauma brings with itself, which has a, a time and a space of its own, then we have a better chance to create a meaning that can create a nice communion between these forms of intentionality and can produce a form of normality that is not pushed on us from external perspective, but is instead uh, coming from the death of our experience. Now, in the chapter I wrote for uh, um, Professor Englander's uh, book, uh, Phenomenology and the Social Context of Psychiatry, I insisted exactly on this point, um, meaning if we intend um, ethics uh, as a practice and as a science, so uh, meaning uh, ethics as uh, a science that is ground, that is uh, founded in the ontological region of the volitional body. So uh, an ethics that studies seriously uh, the complexity of uh, our body, its volitions, and the way in which these volitions uh, make sense, uh, then we can uh, provide for uh, social workers, uh, for psychologists, uh, for clinicians, uh, more powerful tool uh, to develop uh, empathy, to develop uh, a deeper understanding of uh, where uh, the client, uh, the traumatized person, uh, the um, patient uh, is uh, in that moment. Because if we understand these ethics as a science and we share these ethics as a practice in the sense that we practice on ourselves this exercise of aligning our practical intentionality with our active and passive intentionality, then we understand with great clarity how um, our worldview is not limited to an external worldview, that uh, uh, our sense of normality is not uh, dictated from anything uh, external. It's not the same as the normality we might encounter uh, when, uh, I don't know, somebody, um, when we read on a textbook what normality is. Uh, we understand that uh, every case uh, is a case-by-case -case experience, uh, that every client uh, we encounter has uh, ethical assumptions, um, uh, implied meanings uh, that sometimes are hidden to the client itself and requires uh, a, a, a sense of time that is completely different from the linear sense of time to unfold, to speak to us, to speak to uh, his or her body, first of all. I'm thinking here of K-Tomb's uh, um, 
brilliant writing on um, diagnosis and illnesses, uh, how she writes on the asymmetry of the time that is uh, present when there's the medical encounter and the doctor is giving a bad diagnosis to a client. Uh, the doctor's life, uh, for as much as it can be hit by this bad diagnosis, uh, will keep going. Uh, the patient's life is going to change forever. And even if that is just a minute, uh, the meaning of that diagnosis has the power to change the life of that person forever. In that moment, that client has, that patient has to reorganize all the meanings of its life, all the passive synthesis, all that it has been lived before. It's as if the flow of life uh, suddenly overwhelms that person that takes a life of its own without the ability to embody it again to and live it again so um in this chapter i wrote for this book i used uh, uh, rogers uh, mayers uh, um, i use a, a, a certain humanistic psychology to encourage um an approach with uh, with uh, with clients that uh, encourages a, a focus on the client, a positive regard and unconditional positive regard uh, toward the client, an appreciation of the client's time rather than our time, a use of a bouquet. Um, to parenthesize all that concerns uh, us as a recipient of that story in order to help the client to uh, reconnect, recreate that alignment between a passive, uh, practical and active intentionality. What happens in traumatic experiences is that the, the, sorry, the passive intentionality, so this flow of life detaches from uh, um, the active intentionality because our volitional body cannot take it because our, our volitional body is afraid of saying yes to um, that strong amount of information that comes from uh, the flow of life. So uh, the uh, social worker, the clinician, the counselor has, uh, uh, or the parents, you know, any helper figure around uh, the traumatized person has to help the patients to stay there and have to clarify the ethical assumptions the meanings, um, all the contents that are contained in this passive synthesis uh, in order to create a normalization that does not come artificially from the outside, but comes from within. Here, I don't want to mean outside, inside as two strict categories because uh, uh, it wouldn't work in phenomenology. I think that also rejects any uh, categorical division inside and outside. You are, in fact, you clinician, you therapist uh, are the inside and the outside side of your client. Um, this is another uh, discussion that probably it's better to uh, relate to, to, to another video, to another moment. But in general, what I, what I was trying to say is that uh, uh, the normalization needs to start from within, from the interconnection, the interconnection with uh, this passive synthesis. And this passive synthesis uh, talk about life. The organic life and in this organic life uh, there's the whole life of the client with its intersubjective life world, the connections it, uh, this person has had with everyone in its own life. And it's this organic intersubjective interaffective life that has to come up to the volitional body and be accepted and acquire to acquire a, a, a meaning, a sense uh, through the active intentionality. Is uh, through this kind of normalization that uh, we can improve our sense of uh, um, empathy, of uh, um, 
understanding of the person we have in front of us. So in that sense, I think that phenomenology can provide uh, um, incredibly useful tools to investigate uh, uh, quite qualitatively, of course, uh, the life of uh, any person who is uh, in front of us, because it has the tool to, in, to enter into that lived experience and patiently unraveling uh, the riddle that this experience uh, uh, brings in itself. Now, uh, this is just a general uh, uh, description of uh, the chapter. Um, of course, the, in the chapter, I stay more on uh, um, certain sources uh, and uh, uh, I, I clarify um, more uh, um, about uh, the volitional body, about uh, practical intentionality, active intentionality, and so on. But here, I just wanted to give you a full picture of, uh, of the problem and uh, um, to introduce you to a possible use of phenomenology into um, um, the psycho um, into psychiatry, psychology, or uh, other uh, social work. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this video. If you have questions, uh, please let me know. I will be more than happy uh, to, to answer and to help you unraveling uh, this uh, complex matter, but uh, more easy to apply than to explain, I would say. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy your day and take care. Bye.